I want to thank everybody at the Rachel Carson Centre, past and present. I think I can make a stronger claim than most in saying that the RCC has made me the scholar that I am. And given all the really inspiring people who've stood here over the many years, I feel especially honoured to be standing here myself today. This talk is drawn from the research for my research project at the RCC. Um, the project's called Offshore, Energy Cultures of the North Sea. And it's been funded by the German Research Council for three years. And I'm currently just about halfway through. So this means that I'm really just getting to the stage of starting to uh, articulate my ideas. So you'll have to bear with me if some of my ideas are not fully, fully articulated, but I'm definitely getting there. I'm really happy that I got to follow on from Steve Mentz last week and con continue where he left off in talking about blue humanities and the sea. I'm interested particularly in the North Sea. If you look at the North Sea on the map, you will see this nice empty expanse of blue that stretches from the northern French coast all the way up to Norway. But if you look at a map that shows the oil and gas installations um, in the North Sea, it looks a lot less empty and a lot less blue. An even less blue view is in the map, that's the one on the right, by Nancy Cooling, that shows the way the North Sea was divided into blocks and portioned out by the surrounding nations. This happened in the 1960s, once it started to be suspected that there might be oil deposits under the sea floor, significant oil deposits. But the first really big oil find, which, so there was the Groningen gas field in, the, I think, the early 1950s, but the first significant oil find was um, in the Norwegian sector on the Ekofisk oil field in December 1969. Not long after that, there were large amounts of oil found in the British sector too. So the year 1969 is often taken as the key turning point of the North Sea oil story the moment that years of searching were, were rewarded and fortunes began to change. The Norwegians often refer to their experience of oil uh, using the term olje eventure. This means kind of like the oil fairy tale. And that's where I got the idea for the title of this talk. There are lots of fairy tale tropes in oil exploration. There's the quest for black gold, the false promises, the dogged heroes who keep on trying, the rewards of untold riches. So that's the, the slide just shows some like the, the covers of books, or in one case it's a film, um, that use this idea, Olje Aventure, the, the oil fairy tale. Um, but like all good fairy tales, the Olje Aventure, so the oil story, allows for different interpretations and interpretations that shift over time. Is the black gold really gold? Who are the heroes in the story and who are the villains? And perhaps most importantly of all, does the fairy tale have a happy ending? So my way into this topic, so into, the, into looking at offshore oil in the North Sea, is through looking at the kind of culture that it has produced, or the way that culture, onshore culture has represented North Sea oil. Um, so looking at things like novels and films, and looking at how they are telling the story of what's happening in the North Sea. One really interesting thing is that there's been a, something of an explosion of interest in oil in the past decade or two. This is just a selection of texts. And when I say texts, I'm saying, using that term in the, the very broad sense. So a text for me can, be, it can also be an exhibition. Um, it can be prose or poetry or a novel. It could be a TV show or a film. So anything that I can read in a sense. Um, these are all texts that have come out of Norway or the UK and are concerned with North Sea offshore oil specifically, and that are all fairly recent. In fact, I think only one of the texts shown on the slide here is uh, older than 10 years old. So they're pretty, pretty recent, some of them only a couple of years old. Um, so there's something of a boom going on in reading and writing and thinking about the offshore industry and its role in the world. <laughs> 
I find this new interest in North Sea oil and gas interesting, also because um, offshore industries are not generally a very visible part of the culture. The editors of this recent edited collection, called Cold Water Oil, um, note in their introduction that, uh, and I'm quoting them, offshore petroleum extraction typically occurs well out of sight of land and within a context of deliberately cultivated corporate secrecy, end quote. So it's not something we see much of in sort of mainstream culture, and the oil companies have little interest generally in making it more visible. And this is why I think as well that culture has quite an important role to play when it comes to the offshore industries. Because for quite a lot of us, and I include myself in this, images on TV or models in a museum or descriptions in a book are probably the closest we are going to get to an actual oil rig or pipeline. Unless you happen to live in an oil city like Aberdeen or Stavanger, or maybe near a refinery, or maybe if you have a relative who works in the oil industry. I mean, there are various ways in which we might feel closer, um, but by and large, it's an industry that is quite remote from our daily lives. And that's despite the fact that so much of our daily lives are totally dependent on the abundance of energy that is underwritten by oil and gas. So in my project, I've been looking back at the decades since the Ecofisk discovery of 1969 and looking for traces of the offshore industry in cultural texts. Until quite recently, there hasn't really been that much to find. So you can kind of read about people getting new jobs, uh, going offshore and coming back, and making money. Money is often like the most, uh, the clearest trace of what's going on. So the oil rigs themselves are mostly out of sight, and they're, they're offshore. But that does change when something goes seriously wrong. And so now I want to focus on two major accidents that happened in offshore oil in the North Sea in the 1980s. And that's the capsizing of the Alexander Shelland platform in 1980 in the Norwegian sector, and the explosion on the Piper Alpha platform in 1988 in the uh, Scottish waters or British waters. So the first accident, the Alexander Shelland, um, occurred on the evening of the 27th of March, 1980. The rig, which was being used as accommodation for offshore workers, what they sometimes call a flotel, um, initially tilted and about 20 minutes later uh, capsized into the water. Safety provisions were poor, lifeboats inoperable, and the weather conditions made it especially difficult to retrieve survivors from the icy waters. 123 men lost their lives. Eight years later, on the 6th of July 1988, a ball of fire engulfed the Piper Alpha rig, the result of miscommunication and poor safety procedures. 167 men died, and many of the survivors were really badly injured. Now, offshore oil and gas has been beset by accidents and spills, both prior to 1980 and afterwards. Helicopters have crashed into the sea, Divers have failed to return to the surface, and oil spills have killed wildlife and ruined local ecologies. But the scale of these two accidents, the Shelland and the Piper Alpha, represented a real fracture in the fairy tale of North Sea oil for Norway and Great Britain, respectively. And they provoked local and national responses. Despite, or perhaps because of the extent of the trauma, there are very few artistic or cultural representations of or responses to the accidents from the first three decades after, the, after they happened. Um, so there are, there are things like there's a, a big uh, inquiry in both cases, a big report, um, safety uh, concerns, lots of newspaper articles. But in terms of kind of um, imaginative or emotional responses, besides some trauma memoirs, there's uh, relatively little. Um, the memorial to those who died in the Alexander Shelland, that's the abstract sculpture of a broken chain, um, you can see in the middle, designed by Johannes Blockhelm, installed on a hillside well away from central Stavanger, seems really designed not to call too much attention to the memory. In Aberdeen, the oil company concerned, it was Phillips, um, initially refused to pay for a, for a memorial, and it tried to suppress the work of the artist Sue Jane Taylor, who'd been out on the rigs, um, eventually, her sculpture was built, um, and it stands in Hazelhead Park in Aberdeen, again, well away from the centre of the city. Um, the memorial window by Jennifer Jane Bayliss, which you can see on the right, and I think it's one of a couple of memorial windows, 
um, is perhaps one of the most central, prominent um, tributes to uh, the 167 men who died in the disaster. This one is in Ferry Hill Church in Aberdeen, and it was designed by a member of the congregation. So, not very much um, active memorialisation at the time, but some 40 years after the accident, those with direct memories of the Alexander Shellan disaster are mostly retired. And the keepers of its memory are those who were children when it happened. This generational shift has given rise to a new culture of memory, both around the disasters and around oil in general, one that has more appetite to work through the traumas of the past and is pre prepared to reflect more critically on the costs and benefits of the oil boom years. While the moments of the accident in 1980 and 1988 served to make the oil industry and its risks visible nationally and internationally, albeit, as we've seen, fairly briefly, and provoked, at the time, political discussions around the human cost of oil, the memory of the disasters four decades on rekindles these discussions against the darkening backdrop of anthropogenic climate change and its threat for the future of humanity. And that's what I'd like to look at in more detail now. The Alexander Shelland and the Piper Alpha disasters do not find their way into fictional representation before about six years ago. So in 2016, um, the first of these, it's four texts, in fact, even though there's a fifth picture, uh, the first of these texts was published. And that's the novel that was first published as The Waves Burn Bright in 2016 and has been republished this year, um, in, as you can see in the picture at the bottom, under the title of In the Shadow, of Piper Alpha, so with an even more explicit um, uh, reference to the disaster which plays a part in the story. 2016, then there's the, um, the film Oljöngö, um, which is on um, show in the Oil Museum in Stavanger. You can see it there. It's a short film commissioned by the museum, but it is also a, it's an art film. It's a fictional story. Um, the State of Happiness, big television drama that's been... Uh, was made for Norwegian television but has since been broadcast internationally. It's uh, had two series out, there's a third coming. Also uh, represents the Alexander Shellen disaster in series two, episode seven. Um, but also quite a lot of the discourse around it comes up into the TV series. And finally the novel uh, Pustlinger by Atle Berger uh, was published in 2019. Um, so those four texts, all very recent, uh, deal with the disasters. I haven't got time now to introduce you to all of them properly, so I will just concentrate on the two novels and be as kind of quick and uh, efficient as I can in telling you what's, what's in them very roughly. So to take the first text, which I'm going to refer to by its republished title, so In the Shadow of Piper Alpha, um, the protagonist of this novel is Carrie, uh, who's a young geology professor um, who grew up in Aberdeen. Her father was also a geologist and was involved in the oil industry. And it's this relationship between father and daughter that drives the plot of the novel. The strain in their relationship dates back to the Piper Alpha disaster and the fallout from it. In the novel, Carrie's dad survives the explosion but is deeply traumatised. The novel moves between flashbacks from Carrie's childhood and from the accident and aftermath and the present of the novel, which sees Carrie return to Aberdeen for the first time in many years and forces a confrontation with her father and the past. And in fact, even though I've said Carrie's the protagonist, in a way, her father is also equally important and the novel is narrated by both of them in turn, or, yeah, focalised on both of them in turn. The second novel, so this is the Puslingar, the Norwegian writer Atle Berger, uh, published in 2019. Um, Puslingar translates roughly as, like, puny little people. Um, it's, the title is taken from a citation by a 19th century Norwegian writer who is called Alexander Schelland. So there's the connection to the disaster, if you didn't already get it from the cover design, um, which so the references the writer Alexander Schelland who gave his name to the rig, which uh, capsized in 1980. Um, it's a 19th century novel, a realist novel, part of the big wave of Scandinavian social realism which also then is a kind of um, link in terms of genre to this novel, Puslinger. The protagonist of this novel is Marita, so another female protagonist, who was a child when her father died in the Shellan disaster. And Marita doesn't know exactly how he died. His body's never recovered. 
but she idolises her father, and her aim in the novel is to become an engineer in the oil industry. Um, her father was an unqualified oil worker, um, and Marita is trying to make good the kind of class and dialect barriers that held him back um, in order to take up a place at the University of Trondheim, which is Norway's premier university for engineering. Um, and in the novel, she builds a relationship with her father's best friend, Trygve, who was also on the rig um, when it capsized, but who survived. And he's suffering from the effects of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. So rather like uh, Marcus in the, the other novel, you've got these two fathers or two father figures representing the, the oil generation and their daughters who are growing up with this. So there are quite a lot of similarities between these two texts. Um, and I think there's something worth pursuing and looking at them in comparison. So firstly, there's the fact that they were written about the same time and with this oil theme. They have both deal with more than just the disaster, they deal with, with oil, the oil industry. Um, secondly, that they imagine that these two disasters of the 1980s. Um, I don't think there have been any other fictional reworkings of the Alexander Shelland or the Piper Alpha disaster, to my knowledge, before the turn of the millennium. Um, although there are oblique references in text to the danger and the risks of offshore work um, that would serve as a reminder to anyone who remembers the disasters about what that might be calling to mind. Thirdly, the, both the texts embed the offshore oil industry in this context of intergenerationality. The protagonists, Carrie and Marita, um, in our text, are children born during the boom years of North Sea oil, the children of offshore workers. And the key driver of the narrative in each of the novels is the intergenerational conflict and the need for the children to understand their parents. And fourthly, both narratives resolve in the themes of overcoming trauma, rebuilding family relationships, and coming to terms with a difficult past. That part in particular has something of the fairy tale about it. It makes for the happy ending that provides narrative closure and a sense of things having been, been put right to some degree even if the texts don't gloss over the, the huge tragedy um, of the offshore disasters. So I'd, I'd like to argue that these texts are kind of classical examples of what the, it's called in German Vergangenheitsbewältigung. So this means kind of um, the struggle to overcome the, the past, meant by that is a negative past, or it can mean working through the past. And it's a term that's been used particularly for German literature post-1945, um, but it, it has been extended in German studies to other contexts, such as in the wake of German reunification. It's another difficult past which requires um, more than one generation of working through. Um, and there are lots of German novels as, as part of this Vergangenheitsbewältigung that involve the same kinds of generational conflict I've been showing here. So between the fathers, the perpetrators, as it often is, and their children. Um, and there are the same kinds of issues at stake here in, in the broader sense. The trauma and tragedy that people have lived through and which still affect them, but also questions of blame and guilt that radiate out beyond the catastrophes themselves to become general questions of morality and ethical behaviour. And so the fact that these texts were written and published so recently is important because of the way that conversations about fossil fuels have intensified in the last few years. The difficult past that the texts are trying to overcome, the trauma at the heart of the relationships, is not just the accidents that happen on the North Sea, I argue, but it's the business of oil extraction itself. There is the immediate violence of the accidents, but also the slow violence, to use Rob Nixon's term, of petrochemical modernity. The father figures in the texts are directly involved in the oil industry, have earned money from it, and the disasters they experience are mainly the result of negligence and greed on the part of the oil companies. But, in these, novel, but these novels have been written at a moment in time when the oil industry is being criticised and interrogated as never before. Each of the texts references the ecological damage caused by offshore drilling. Even though they're not ecological texts, they're not clarified, these are not explicitly about that. Um, but, but they do reference the wider problem of oil and gas extraction, and it's made part of the the general picture of the novels. Um, and if we take the older generation of oil workers, so the fathers, the father generation, as standing for um, the, the generation that threw themselves into the offshore industry and the pursuit of cheap fuel, then these novels put them on trial. 
They're on trial by their children, not just for the human cost of oil, but also the ecological cost. The texts imply that it is up to the next generations to try and understand what their fathers were doing in the oil industry and to exonerate them or find them guilty. And this is where the fairy tale comes in again, or at least the structure of a story that works towards closure. The novels reach resolution in different ways, but there is a clear trend, in my view, in these two texts towards exoneration of the fathers. In Atle Berger's novel, The Pusslinger, so that's the Norwegian one, where the actual father has in fact died, and it's the, the daughter has a relationship with his um, best friend who survived, there is a strong message of sacrifice. Johnny and Trygve, the two friends from the poor rural North Nordhordland area of Western Norway, were sacrificed for Norway's new prosperity and progress. In my reading of the novel, Johnny's daughter Marita it's, has to make sure their sacrifice wasn't in vain by becoming an engineer herself and using that new prosperity to get a good education um, without losing pride in her regional identity, which is a big part of the novel. The historian, um, sorry, I can move forward. The historian Maybrit Orma Nielsen um, writes that the human and environmental costs were seen as tragic but almost unavoidable for a nation that wanted to live on oil. Atle Berger's novel seems to me to be quite in line with that idea, that the tragic cost was the price of uh, Norway's prosperity, and that's the kind of prosperity that will give Marita a future outside of what had, for many generations, been a very limiting poverty in that part of Norway. It's worth noting, too, that it happens to be a daughter who is able to profit from the possibility of a state-funded university place to study engineering. And Marita's grandfather does try to tell her um, at one point that oil rigs and engineering are no place for a woman. But then he's quite old and he dies halfway through the book, so then she doesn't have that obstacle anymore. Um, oil has bought her financial freedom, but also the novel implies emancipation from uh, gender roles. Berger's book does not really explore the environmental problems of oil, in, in depth at least, that come along with this progress. There is one place where Marita's school friend and her stepfather start to lecture her about the greenhouse effect and the hole in the ozone layer, um, and she immediately shouts them down. She says, uh, but Jesus Christ, lads, your whole fucking lives are made of oil. So that's my translation, sorry. And, um, and she lists all the things that they depend on oil for. Clothes, paint, plastic in all its many forms, fertiliser and preservatives, Mama's nail polish remover, my Lego bricks, the chewing gum in your gob, Einar, the glue that's holding your stupid books together, insulation, furniture, your cassette tapes and skis, Einar, and asphalt, for heaven's sake. Your father's credit card, William, isn't just full up with oil revenue from Lindos District. It's made of oil. Do you not know that? So the view of the Alexander Shellan disaster as a tragic but almost necessary sacrifice is upheld. Ian Maloney's novel, so this is the Piper Alpha novel, does complicate this a bit. For one thing, the father in this case, Marcus, is not a simple oil worker, but he's a geologist. He's someone who understands something about the industry he's working in. And also, he's a, a drinker and a womanizer. So he's not portrayed as being an innocent victim, or innocent at all, really, in the same way as Johnny and Trigva. He comes to realise in the course of the text that he should have known more or thought more about what his work was for. And that's part of the reason for this like, terrible post-traumatic guilt that he has. The greatest cost of the disaster has already been paid by others. While Carrie is waiting in hospital for news of survivors from the Piper Alpha, a man says to her, there's a decent living to be made out of the North Sea. God sure saw so sure it was well stocked with things we'd find useful, but by Christ he made the cost too high. So the cost here refers immediately to the human victims of the disaster. But as with Pusslinger, I think you can read that as extending into the environmental and ecological costs of oil and gas extraction. The environmental damage caused by the oil industry is referenced in the text, both explicitly and implicitly, through the portrayal of geological processes and forms. As Carrie she's an academic, um, flies to yet another conference. She does fly a lot. She ponders on the state of the planet. The face of Scotland is scarred by glaciers, geological wrinkles, gouged by rivers of ice advancing, retreating for millions of years. Over enough time, these scars will disappear, 
worn down by weather, wind and rain, turning rocks to sand, washing it into the sea, washing Scotland away. Given enough time, everything erodes. The glaciers are still retreating, global warming melting the permafrost. Each summer, more and more of Greenland is exposed. The scars, the wounds, consequences, the end of the world. Not that climate change is the end for the planet. We're creating the conditions for our own extinction, and no geological scientist would ever confuse the two. And so, in this novel, the emphasis in the narrative is less on sacrifice and more on atonement. Carrie becomes a geologist too, is enormously successful. She's a tenured professor at 30 with a choice of jobs all over the world, which must be lovely. Uh, and uh, Carrie's work on volcanoes leads her to work on safety in geothermal energy, which leads to an impassioned conference paper at the end of the novel in which she says, uh, what my work shows is, is that the age of petroleum is over. Geothermal energy is no longer a dream, it's reality. And that reality means the death of the oil industry. So Carrie atones for the sins of her father by pushing back against the industry that destroys lives and the planet. I would also like note that both Carrie and her high-flying partner Ash do spend an awful lot of time in the novel a jetting around the globe for people who want to see the end of the oil industry. So there's a, in some ways maybe the text is just dated because I think there's been a lot of movement since 2016 in terms of academic flying. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it seems to be quite a symbolic atonement that does not take account of her glamorous academic lifestyle and its dependence on aviation fuel. So both of the novels take a sentimental approach to closure and reconciliation in terms of the issue of offshore oil and its human and environmental costs. In the first case, this is done by using a trope of sacrifice that is shown not to be in vain, in the second, it's a trope of atonement for wrongs committed. In both The Shadow of Piper Alpha and in Puslingar, while neither seek to underplay the extent of the trauma to those who lived through it, and I do want to stress that, they dwell a long time on, on the suffering, there is a sense in which the accidents function as frameworks for human and ecological conflicts over oil to become visible and provide a narrative turning point that sets the stage for reconciliation, assimilation and closure. But if there is one thing that the oil industry has so far proved resistant to, it's closure. And this is where I see the problem with the conventions of narrative and fiction and form when applied to the intractable nature of fossil fuel extraction. Oil exploration and drilling continues unabated. And the list of major accidents, like the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010, uh, continues to grow. The fractures in the story of oil have at most been papered over. Um, the trauma is assimilated into cultural memory. The underlying conflicts are not resolved. This is not in any way a fairy tale. As we move into the age of tough oil and tough politics, we need representations of the oil age that resist the temptation to deliver any sense of a happy ending. Thank you very much.